All right, y'all. Well, uh, welcome in. Thank you so much for being back here for our first uh, Texas Talks uh, of the fall season. Um, we're really excited to have a, a great lineup this fall um, and beginning with Hans today. Hans is the founder of By Way of Dallas. Um, he has an amazing story to share with us today and uh, has created something really special here for uh, the city. And so if you would uh, put your hands together and let's welcome him. Thank you, sir. How are you guys doing today? Great. Sorry, this earpiece is, it just feels weird, but it's, I'm just not used to it, but. It's your TED talk, let's do it. <laughs> Texas talk, actually, Texas, Texas talk. talk. Anyway, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I feel like I haven't literally talked to humans in like months, so I have the office and I go home. I just kind of just do my own thing. So whenever they asked me to do this, I was very excited at the same time, very like, oh shit, what am I getting myself into? Do I know how to talk to people anymore? But this is actually really fun because I feel like naturally I like to tell stories and I like to share my story, but this, what I'm gonna show you guys, isn't necessarily a structured type, this is what you do or this is what I've done. It's more like I created this last night at 10 p.m., so this is what you're gonna get. <laughs> but that's fun, you know? But it'll still be hopefully uh, informal or an inform, get, you guys will understand what I'm talking about when you see it. Um, anyway, we'll start with a quick who the hell I am. My name is Hans, uh, a chance without the C, and I am from Denver, Colorado. Despite this thing called Byway of Dallas, I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado. And I've never been skiing ever in my life, and I'm very proud of that. Um, I think skiing is great, but it just was not for me. Actually, my coaches in high school sports, they wouldn't let us go in the, the foothills, so I had, but I've never been skiing. Um, I was in a Pizza Hut commercial with John Elway when I was about eight years old, and that was fun. I got paid zero, while well, he got paid millions, probably. And then also, I've never seen The Lion King ever in my life. And these are just fun facts that have absolutely nothing to do with anything, but I'm proud of that and right that, that as well, and I'm, I'm holding out for, I don't know, maybe I'll never see it, but it's a nice little notch I have in my belt. I hate bananas, but I love banana bread. So that's pretty much all you need to know about me right now. Um, well, what I want to talk about today is that some people do these things, and more others. A lot of people have fun and do interesting things with their lives, but you know what I like to do? I make decks for fun. And does everybody know what I'm talking about when I mention a deck? Pretty much. So when I literally say I make decks for fun, I literally make decks for fun. And I'm going to walk you guys through 1,001 deck themes for automatic success. <laughs> Exclusively for the 61 people that actually showed up at the Waxspace Texas Talk thingy featuring Hans Taplin. I guarantee you. If you follow these steps or the, the deck ideas that I've had, you will have automatic success. I'm just kidding about that. Do not take me literally on that. Um, but before I move on, um, the reason why I spend a lot of time making decks is generally so I can um, prepare myself. And any idea that I have, it's I'm not a good person to like just write it down and like make a list. I take one idea and I take it to the very possible end of that idea. And it's something, it's an exercise that has literally has helped me get to where I am and where I want to go um, just by organizing and, and keeping things structured. Otherwise, I'm going to forget, but I'll take one idea and I'll just keep shelling it out and shelling it out until I have this, I've spent three hours on a deck or so, and I'm like, why did I do this? I don't know, but I'll, I'll, I'll store it away. And so it's kind of like preparing for opportunities that haven't kind of happened yet, but it gives you that opportunity to present something just in case, spur of the moment, you meet with a potential partner. It's like, okay, we're talking about this. I have an idea in my, in my deck bank for this. So there's just a long list of, of decks that I have. So, so I know we have about two hours today, so I think we'll be able to get through all 1,001. I, I think we'll see it. You ready? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, don't learn anything in school. Learn how to get out of school. And this is very near and dear to me because I went to a school called Abilene Christian University in Abilene, Texas. And if you guys have ever been to Abilene, there's absolutely nothing there. But it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because there is nothing there. 
And why I say don't learn anything in school, learn how to get out of school, I think the hustle is literally being dropped off on campus and say, I've got, I gotta get out of here in four years. How the hell am I gonna get this degree and get on the road and get to a, my next level? Because we've all, I've had, I had that moment in college where I was like, maybe, maybe I wanna stay here another, my fifth or sixth year. And I realized that that's just gonna keep me from progressing to my goals. And a lot of people, I mean, listen, education is the foundation for success. But I think we've been taught the wrong way. I think you gotta learn how to get out of school. The, the message in that to me is like, you know, going through a maze, you gotta learn how to get the hell out of that maze. I feel like school can be a maze. You're gonna learn way more things outside of that campus than you'll ever learn inside of a campus. Again, these are directly related to me um, and how I spent my time in Abilene. Next one, you won't get to where you want to go by doing homework. Um, I have an eight-year-old kid, so he'll never hear this statement. He'll never see this statement ever. But uh, going back to school, um, and I promise this isn't all about school, I watched some of my roommates just study all night and stress themselves out, and I got to get an A, I got to get all this stuff, and I... I kind of looked back and I said, you know what, I'll take all C's. If that means I get this degree, I'm, I'm going to take all C's because to me, the, the process of doing homework and having to like solve these problems just to turn in, just to memorize, just would have never, ever helped anybody become successful by, by, mem by the way that we would learn back when I was in school is just by memory. It was all this homework and all these tests like, nah, you know what, I'll take C's and I, I had a couple of D's, but you know what? Like, it worked for me, and I think it, it can work for a lot of people. And this is a, a message that actually is outside of school. Homework is something, I mean, it's, it's, it's discipline, but there's so many other things that you could be doing instead of memorizing things, instead of trying to, try to uh, convince yourself that, oh, I have to know this. There's, open your mind up to, to, to a lot of other possibilities instead of just being stuck right into in one same subject, thinking it's going to create success for you, if that makes sense. It may not make sense, but uh, next. Um, oh my gosh, so Dallas. Getting better and worse at the same damn time. Um, I created a deck based on this idea because it's true. I feel like Dallas is, uh, we all know Dallas is progressing. But at the same time, we're failing at the same time. We're building a lot of cool infrastructure and a lot of cool restaurants and bars but that's not saving any issues. I personally used to say, oh, I, you know, I worked for Nike for about 10 to 12 years or so, and I thought I wanted to be one of the biggest creative directors of Nike. And then I realized that is not gonna fulfill my goal. I would rather be the creative director of Dallas, and that is essentially why I created this platform called By, By Way of Dallas, to kind of help solve this getting better and worse at the same time. Uh, Trey Green right here, he's a creative strategist for, for By Way of Dallas, and we talk, oops, we talk all the time about some of the challenges and uh, things that we want to change about Dallas. And it does not progress unless we do. And it does not, it's not going to work. We're not going to get to our goals if we don't continue to look at this message and say, how can we, how can we keep pushing this better? So this is a, this is a deck that uh, I would love to share at some point publicly. Um, it probably has more of the meat and potatoes of where By Way of Dallas is going and where we've been. Next, um, oh, I love this one. The future belongs to the few of us still willing to get our hands dirty. And what that is gonna do is gonna help solve these problems of, of how, if we all continue to work together, like I feel like even everybody that, that kid showed up today, you're kind of a part of the story right here. It's, it's Friday, it's 9 a.m., we could be doing other things and instead of listening to me ramble about these goofy topics, but it's, it's, you know, the future literally belongs to the few of us still when I get, willing to get our hands dirty. Um, I personally hate yard work. I cannot stand it. Um, I hate mowing my lawn. I hate doing all that stuff. But I know I still have to get my hands dirty if I don't want my house to look like the goofiest house on the block. You just have to be willing to, to continue to, to, to get to that, that level and that point too for your goal. Uh, next, uh, Frank Sinatra. I didn't write a deck on Frank Sinatra, but I have a deck based on this idea here. If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Have you guys heard that, that, that phrase before? Well, what I think 
what Hans Taplin thinks, and I think we're going, it's fading. No, is it coming back? What Hans Taplin thinks is, if you can make it in Dallas, you can make it anywhere. And to me, what this means, and I lived in New York for about two and a half, three years, and I was, um, and New York is great. The cities on the coast are, are incredible. But what makes Dallas, Dallas, is that there's really not much here to make cool like New York. I feel like if you go to New York and you, you do your thing out there, you're surrounded by opportunities. You're surrounded by things that, I don't, I'm not gonna say that they're easy, but everything is cool. You, we can easily like, oh, get a job here, and you know, then they're, they're doing fashion week, they're doing all these things, but if you can build something in Dallas that don't, that don't have these particular platforms and these particular, well, we don't have anything here. If you can build something in Dallas and make it relevant and make the, make the people on the coast be like, what's happening in Dallas? That is the true mark of success. So I really believe if you can make it in Dallas, you can make it anywhere. I've seen, I mean, I have a lot of my friends who are creatives who, you know, shot off to the coast and I think they're doing incredible work, but I really appreciate the creatives that decide to stay here in Dallas and help us reach those goals that I was mentioning earlier. Um, because it's, it can get very frustrating and Trey and I talk about this all the time, how, wow, we're, it's the same old thing on the weekends. It's how can, but how can we change, like wax space, this place is incredible. This was not here a long time ago and I think it's really helping shape a creative community um, out here in Oak Cliff. We just need more of this, so creatives, please stay here. I'll, Trey will pay your rent and he'll, he'll. <laughs> stay here, don't go to New York City. Visit. Um, but I love New York, my sister lives there anyway. Um, so we're in it for the long run. One thing that I honestly struggled with for a very long time was, was focus. Like, I wanted to do so many different things. I mean, all, as creatives, we all want to be a part of anything and everything. And once I realized that, damn, like, that's just not possible for me to reach particular goals by having my hands everywhere, I've got to focus. And if I'm going to focus, I've got to be in it for the long run. I don't know what I'm doing for Bowery Dallas most of the time, but I'm doing me. But I know that I'm going to do me in the long run forever. So this is a portrait of me jumping over the logo. I don't know why that's relevant, but it looks cool. It looks kind of cool. But we're, on, we're in it for the long run. We all have to be in it together for the long run if we want to make a better Dallas. Side note, this was a graphic that uh, we were going to do a collaboration with Foot Locker, which we canceled it a long time ago. But I was so happy, but at the same time, like, damn, I wish I could have used this. is going to be a like, crew neck t-shirt. It's like, damn, it's pretty dope, but whatever. Next, for both sides of 75. This is a very, very fun topic for me to talk about sometimes because, and if you guys can relate, we'll take Mockingbird Lane, for instance, where it intersects 75. If you're crossing over from the east side of Mockingbird and crossing over to Highland Park, you feel a tension even when you're driving. I don't know what it is. You just feel this just tightness. Like, yes, things, the, even the, the houses and the school and the coffee, everything look, is elevated. But I'm like, this feels weird, you know? But I, for me to reach my goals, I've got to embrace both sides of 75. One thing that I really appreciate about Dallas is the diversity and that, you know, I'm even looking around here, this is a very, very diverse room. And whenever By Way Dallas will have a pop-up, we'll have a Highland Park soccer mom standing in line next to a South Dallas, you know, high school kid. And they're, they're engaging in conversation. And so my, one of my main goals for By Way Dallas is to just simply diversify a room with the most diverse Dallas possible. So being able to to, to speak to both sides of 75, a lot of people kind of alienate each other. We, we have to stop living in silos. And so my, my goals for, for Byway Dallas is to constantly be able to speak to both sides of 75. And this is just an example. This, you know, obviously there's different sectors and highways and neighborhoods, but this is just the easiest way I can explain it that's relatable to me. Does that make sense to you guys? Awesome, okay. How much time do we have, am I good? Okay. because I. I, don't, I didn't actually make 1,001, so I think I'm almost, almost done here. Um, next, your direction is more important than your speed. I honestly can't believe I took all this time to design these things last night. What am I, what am I doing? Um, this is another thing that I struggled with for a long time, is that being wanting to be everything and everywhere, but I wanted to do it 
so fast. I want to get rich quick. I, well, I want to make money quick. I wanted to do all these things before the other guy. And then I realized that if I'm trying to go a thousand miles an hour, that is absolutely taking me away from the direction that is going to help me get to where I want to go. And so the simple, I mean, it's an obvious message here is that we've got to stay in that path, that direction that we know, that we feel, and stop looking what, at what other people are doing. Just do you, stay in your direction, stay in your lane. That's so much more important than the speed that, um, of trying to go first or, or trying to, you know, it's got to make mistakes early. You got to make mistakes when nobody's looking. Um, so this one here is very, very near and dear to my heart that also kind of like explains even how I am as a person where, like I said, I, went, I tried to go so fast for so long and everything crumbled. The amount of, amount of failed projects that are literally in my garage right now is a, is a perfect like representation of this speed. And so once I figured out this direction, I don't, I'm not junking at my garage anymore with a bunch of failed crap. Um, Oh yeah, there's another one. Right now, the only thing that matters is right now. Um, I'm gonna tell a quick personal story that essentially I almost lost my life about, uh, it was a year ago in July because I was thinking too far in advance. I was thinking what am, what am I going to do five years? I mean, you got to have plans and you know, set goals for yourself, like I said earlier, but I was not taking care of myself at the moment. I was dry, trying to do too much. And when I woke up in the hospital for the doctor saying he has about 36 hours to live, this, this clock graphic just kept playing in my head. And I said, you know what, I've got to take care of myself before I run out of time. And I did, a, I did a graphic like this on my IG and I animated and used this music or whatever, but it's always a constant reminder of right now is the really only thing that matters. The fact that we're all sitting here right now listening to me and you know, I've see, I see some familiar, familiar faces. This is, this is all supposed to happen for a reason. And I, 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 I have been able to, since being in the hospital last year, remember this statement and just know that just take your time. No, there's no rush for anything. Things are going to happen the way that they play out. Um, but oddly enough, um, this year, on the same day I went to the emergency room, last year, I almost, well, I crashed on my stupid dirt bike that I had no business driving. And so I found myself almost in the emergency room again. So I think I'm going to get rid of that bike. Trey's like, thank God. This is, well, why is he driving a dirt bike down Mockingbird Lane? Six, well, why? It was just dumb. So it's a good reminder that right now, the only thing that matters is right now. Um, with that said, thank you guys. I appreciate it. I, I'm, I, I, like I said, I don't do a lot of these speaking engagements because I just you know, I like to keep to myself. But this is really special to me because I'm able to share just a few ideas that um, hopefully kind of resonate with you guys, no matter what you guys do. It's just, it's just fun to be able to be that person um, to have a voice and use my platform to at least give a little bit of knowledge, even though some things may not even make sense. Thanks, guys. Uh, we might have time for a few questions, if anybody has one. Um, I'll let Hans call on you. And oh, yes, yes. Hi. Hey. That's a great question. Uh, one of my, I was literally going to add that as a slide that I'm not trendy, but I'm very trend aware. I learned a long time ago, I don't give a shit about what anybody really thinks of me anymore. Like I, I purposely wear things um, and I present myself and make people like, who is this guy? Um, not because I want attention, because I absolutely hate attention, but it's because I got so tired of being wrapped up in status and I knew if I just focused on just being Hans, um, then that was going to be my cool. And if you can maintain being yourself, like Yessie, being Yessie, 
it, people will, will start to realize like, wow, I've never, this person is own individual. Um, and it, it's, it's a really fun thing for me to do. Like I'll literally pick up my kid from, from school wearing loafers, sweatpants, just wild things. That's just what I feel like. It's like that kid on Big Daddy where Adam Sandler like, where would he want Frankenstein? That's how I feel sometimes. And that's just like, I think that really helps shape and keeps the distractions. And I also, last, uh, with that, I don't look at what anybody else is doing. I've, I'm inspired by so much work, but I got wrapped up in a long time of really being like, oh crap, they're doing this type of thing? Man, maybe I should add nah. I'm like, no, 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 no. I know what I want to do, and people will like it if you're a good person and if you have consistency. So that's my definition of being cool. I don't, thank you, I don't think I'm all that cool, but thank, I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Um, I have a, a lot of questions, but um, let's stick to maybe one, and then if there's more time than that, I can always ask my other questions. Uh, I think I've been a fan of By Way since maybe it was Dallas is Dallas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was a throwback. Um, and I love Brent and you kind of talking about the fact of like what makes Dallas, Dallas. I am curious if you could expand into the probably like what you posted that one time about the whole Virgil thing. Mm. Like, how was By Way gonna meet there? Great, that's a great question. So, what he's referring to is that uh, Virgil Abloh, right before he passed, um, I we were I've been working for about a, two years on a collaboration with Virgil Abloh, and um, the I, the stage was set literally it was going to be at the Wiley Theater. We had disposable cameras as the invites, so like. Only way you got into this party is if you brought this disposable camera. We had made, and I, I literally called Fuji, like the, the phone number on the bottom of the disposable, and got on the phone with some guy in Europe, and he shot me to some guy in California. And they're like, sure, we'll give you the, it was just wild. I was like, this is that easy, really? But I guess if Virgil's name's on it, um, it makes it easier. But at the, Erica Badu was going, I'm sorry, DJ Sober, Erica Badu, and uh, Common, and Virgil were going to DJ this party at the Wiley Theater. I'm not sure if you guys know much about the Wiley Theater, but it is downtown in the Arts District. It's a big sil silver cube thing, and it's one of the most incredible structures, I say, damn near North America, because of the way that Ram Cool House had designed it to disrupt the theater. Anyway, so with that said, um, the very last second, I'm talking Erica, Virgil, and Byway Dallas, and Sober, we're all gonna post that, the flyer announcing it. Got a call from Virgil's lawyer saying, he has to cancel, and at that moment, um, in our contract, that clause, it says that, you know, we couldn't get any deposits back. And I, I was so selfish because I was like, man, F this guy, F everything. I literally almost quit By Way of Dallas today because kind of going back to one of the last slides, I had thought that this party was going to mean massive success. I was going to be next to Virgil in the booth, which I, I wouldn't, but it was like, man, why? And, but to answer your question, why Virgil, why Dallas? A, because Virgil had never, he's played in a lot of other cities except Dallas. So the party turned into a Byway Dallas um, uh, presentation to Virgil, featuring Erica and Sober. So we were welcoming and opening the city up for him in a very disruptive manner. I mean, I even designed a, an acrylic DJ booth about the size of this that had a, a box inside with, with neon lights and had real grass, real sod. So my idea is like, I literally wanted this guy when he, when he was come, came out of the green room to come up to the decks and be like, what in the hell, what is going on in Dallas? And that was just, that's just half of the stuff that we had planned. We had, you know, the, 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 the men and women who walk around in the clubs who sell roses and teddy bears, like we hired uh, about 15 of those workers to come and give out free ro roses and teddy bears to people. We had, I made a pinata that was about this big, that was Virgil's head and uh, Erica's head. And we really wanted to connect all cultures. And, sorry, I know, I know I'm going crazy right now. And also, one of the, my favorite things is that the tickets were supposed to be like $350 at the end of the day. And I looked at this, I said, there ain't no damn way I'm gonna charge anybody $350 for a Virgil show. I said, this is gonna be a free show. They were like, what are you talking about free? I said, yeah, it's gonna be free. So what we were able to do is get all those Nothing in Highland Park, but the Highland Park guys who have the money, you guys are gonna buy all the VIP. 
every ticket that they bought would have been like $800. They get to be next to Virgil, whatever. That meant like the, 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 the first 200 people get those, get the trickle down. So it was like, I, I figured out how to make it free for the public. So we had thought of everything. And if you can imagine losing $150,000 in two minutes, and I wanted to quit. It wasn't about the money, it was more about, damn, I thought I was gonna be that guy, but I realized lawyers couldn't tell us, but at the end of the day, six months later, when Sean and his lawyer finally called and said, Hans, the reason why Virgil could not do this because he found out he got sick. And he, she said, and I saw it in an email, that the Byway Dallas collab was the most thing he was excited about. And this was when he, was, he, he had just first started uh, Louis Vuitton, and he was getting ready to do that show. He said this Byway Dallas show was the most incredible idea ever. And then, but I was selfish. I didn't know he was sick, you know? I thought it was just, he was just too busy, but he, he got sick, and that was the last, one of the last things that he would have done that year. So, yeah, hope that answered your question. Yes, sir. So you're not someone who is from Dallas, but you create a brand that in many ways, especially through like the collaborations that you've done, has come to define the city of Dallas. So it's kind of a two-part question. Number one, what was the moment that you decided that Dallas was it? And then number two, how do you view the city in such a way that you can create this space, this kind of like creative energy directed toward a city that, you know, you're not necessarily from, but you take it on as part of who you are. Great question. I love that you asked that question. I'll keep this as simple as possible. After college, when I'm, I, was, I was actually heading to New York City because I thought I got my degree in design. I was like, got to go to New York. But I stopped in Dallas by accident, kind of. I stayed here for two weeks, and I looked around. And I was like, damn. This is back in 2006. I was like, damn, this place sucks. <laughs> Honestly, I was like, there was nothing. There was nothing but the Richards Group, and you know, like, was, I thought that was the, the, the coolest thing. But I said, you know, this is the best place for me, because I like to make myself comfortable with being uncomfortable. I said, I said it right. Um, I always get it back. But I like to challenge myself all the time. I like to do things that aren't the norm. Like, why am I going to go live in New York when there's a billion cool creatives just like me, how about let me stay here when there's, there's nothing happening? And that is going to be an easier way to, for me to have to do whatever the hell I want to do. Um, and what was the second part of that question? So um, as someone who's not from the city, how do you view Dallas in a way that lets you create kind of, kind of such a, um, like such a, it's, it's a brand that has a lot of impact to me on like how Dallas Thank you. Well, with that said, I, I, that, the Bayou Dallas is from my perspective. I got tired of going home and people like in, back home in Denver and people like saying, how are those cows and cowboys and all this stuff? And I'm like, Dallas is nothing like that. And I'm like, I do appreciate those stereotypes because I think that stuff is actually really cool. Like I, I love collecting these like these, these like, Texas whatever, whatever shirts. But like, it doesn't define all of us. And I think that, you know, I used to go out by myself and take party photos at like Silver's parties or whatever. And um, I saw this cool creative like community that was nothing like the Uptown. I thought it was only Uptown, but it went on Greenville at Zubar back in the day. Like, yo, I was like, this is, this is dope. Kids break dance. I was like, I didn't think Dallas had this. So I draw a lot of this of like saying, this is, this is from my perspective. This is how I would do Dallas if I was a creative director. Um, but I, I still love the other cities. I still love Denver, but I've been able to create just a simple path. I used to be, I, I, the, the center, center logo, I designed the center logo. I was a part owner of center from day one for about five, six years. From that, we understood that when I started making merch for that C logo and the Dallas shirts, I was like, damn, people love Dallas, but there's not a, any cool Dallas shirts. So it kind of started with that, you know. By the way, there's a free t-shirt for every, question that somebody asked that I will literally give you today. It's unreleased t-shirt, so. Uh, who are your favorite local collaborators? Uh, maybe even some people we may not know in this room or under, I guess, like guidance in the rest of the world. So like people who I have collaborated with? Yeah, or, or want to. I'll tell you, at the end of each collaboration, I hate everybody, so I'm like. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, that the Scottish, I'm doing a collaboration with the Scottish Rite um, Hospital for children, and that launches next week. And this is not a plug for that, because it's not even really public-facing, but what we've been able to solve for that is 
something to, for inclusion for kids who have limb differences and wear prosthesis. prosthesis. And to be able to give them, a, give them something, instead of them going to school, you know, with a um, prosthesis and being the weird kid, now we're, now they're the kids that go to school and like they're, they can't wait to tell their, their friends about the art that can't say who we have involved. Well, let's say Dak Prescott, he designed for these kids purpose for me. Like that, this Scottish Rite has been a long time co coming and it's what, four years or so? It's crazy. But just to know that you make a difference, I could care less about selling any product. I told that to the Dallas Cowboys, they almost kicked us out. I told that to the Rangers, they almost, but it's like you have to solve a problem to build a community. We use the apparel as a vehicle for people to understand our process, but it's, I would have to say Scottish Rite. I could tell you a bunch of my lease, but, and D Magazine was fun too, when we first did that. Yeah. Kelsey, what's up? What was that last part, the, the, like the what? The, why, why do you think people like the brand so much? What's the main reason? I think because of contrast, because they're, I, don't, I have not seen anything. When I, when I started making, when I created Byway Dallas with literally $3.76 in my account, I, I knew that it had to be different. When everybody goes right, I always go left. If everybody's wearing red shoes, I'm gonna be wearing the blue shoes. So I think it was a breath of fresh air. Of, of I, 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 that's from my perspective. But it could just be because they, because they like the Skyline logo or something like that. I'm not quite sure. But I really hope that people understand that I'm not here. Because I could be doing merch every day. I ha had an opportunity to have two retail stores. It's not about me selling and making money. It's about how, how can I be that career director of Dallas and you know, potentially work with the Scottish Rites and the, things like that. Anybody? Yes, sir. Thank you for everything that you do, man. It's dope, it's dope. Everything yeah, thanks. Cool. Uh, kind of like this. It's, if you want another something designer, right here. Amazing. Don't be mad I said that. But uh, you gave us a lot of good instruction or lessons that you've learned. I feel like the charge of what you're saying is the, the need for Dallas to get better on open getting works. And that the future belongs. Um, that's a good question because I'm not good at teaching anybody anything at all. But from, from my perspective is just always just maintaining that direction no matter what you do. Whether if you're a creative, non-creative, if you're a lawyer, and just, and just be a good person, you know? Like, um, life is short. It's going to sound very just simple, but to me it's just, you know, just, just be able to, to here we go. I was always looking for the person who I, now how I treat things is to be the person I was looking for when I was younger. When I was 15, I knew I wanted to be a clothing designer. I told my mom and she freaked out. She was like, what are you talking about? And you know, back then, it, you just, there weren't Virgil Abloh's, there weren't the, you know, the, the people that, there was no streetwear. So, but I knew, I, you know, I was a graffiti artist. I break dance, I did, but I was like, I know there's something here. It's like, no, let's go to school for business. I was like, I want to be a designer. So anyway, I was looking for somebody like myself back then, but I, so just people be who, be who you were looking for when you were younger. I think that will just help pay it forward, you know? I think, you know? You see? You have no question? Yeah. Design for me is um, 
it's one of the most stressful things in the world because I'm never satisfied with my own design. Like, the good thing I did this thing late last night because other, I mean, uh, I was here this morning trying to tweak it. I was like, what am I doing? Who cares? It doesn't matter. But like, for instance, this, this like hodgepodge of stuff, oh crap, where'd it go? It doesn't, it doesn't make, it makes sense, but from what I was taught is that white space, layout, structure, consistent typography, I took all that stuff and just threw it out the window. So for, for me, it's more about how does this communicate? How does, this is what my brain literally kind of works like, how it looks. This is how I think, and it's all over the place most of the time. And, but it, it works and I think it resonates because it isn't following those normal rules. Um, and it's fun to kind of puke things out. I'm a maximalist, you know, instead of the, the minimal, a little smaller, nah, I'm gonna throw it all everywhere. Sometimes, sometimes I like, you know, minimalism, but um, it's, 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 but it is important to get to a place where you kind of have to be satisfied because the, the, the viewer doesn't know, like, they only know what they see. So it's like, you're just battling yourself trying to get this right and get it perfect. Just for, you know, it's just like a constant battle, but I'm like, who cares? You got, I mean, it doesn't matter because I'm my own critic. Whatever I put out, it's, it's gonna work for, for me, hopefully, you know. Did that answer your question? Maybe. It, it answered a great, great deal, yeah. Cool. And it's fine, it's fine. No, answer that really quick. So, obviously, uh, <laughs> Dan's is a perfectionist. And so I battle with him a lot of times of your work is head and shoulders better than anybody that we can come in contact with. But he has a, such an eye for what he wants to see. So for any creator, I always try to tell them that it will never be perfect, but what you're going to put out will be better than anybody can come close to. Yeah. So let's take the risk together and really figure out what the community says about it. Now, as you can see, Hans is a very particular uh, designer, but I, I think I'll just add that nugget of almost trying to get him to understand that your work is going to be better, you know? Like, it's, it's hard to explain beyond that, but I, I just wanted to add. Yeah, I've got this trumpet that I literally worked on for three years that I made, it saved Dallas, and I, it is incredible, and it will never probably... Don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> if you guys see this thing, but I'm like, I still gotta tweak it. You know, three years, maybe before, it's, but it's still, it drives me crazy, but it's, it's cool. <laughs> three quick questions, and then we'll just wrap it, nothing too deep. Um, number one, is there anything beyond the password on the website? Yeah. Number, number two, uh, what's up with the new stand? How did that happen, right? And then uh, number three, are we ever gonna see like the photos that we all took with the disposable? What photos? You know the ones that you were doing with the necklace with the disposable, the Kodak ones? I, I, I think you're like one of the only ones who got one of those. No, I, well, I took I took one. You gave it to me, but I'm like, where the, I want to see the photos. You know? Oh, you gave it back to me. Yeah. Damn, he's <laughs> calling me out. I'll have to look for it. Um, I want to see the photos. <laughs> sorry, y'all. I, I, I'm sure it's wrong. <laughs> Second thing, that the newspaper box, that was just a dumb idea that I I was probably looking somewhere and was like, damn, I remember those things. Went on uh, eBay. This guy was selling one for like 20 bucks, and I was like, let me just paint it. How can I utilize this to get people out of their house and come get some free stuff? So just a dumb idea. I created a deck out of that too, and it made and it worked. Um, and what was the first question? I'm sorry. Uh, is there anything beyond the oh. password? Everybody I go when I look at the movies like, what's the password? I'm like, I don't know if there's is a password. There, there is something beyond there, but nobody has the password. N nobody, um, because we're waiting for that moment to to release things. The reason why I have the password is not because I'm being this jerk, but Whenever you have a website, it feels like my house. It feels like if, if, I, uh, if I go to dinner, I leave my house, my door open in my house, and people just walk in and look at my stuff, look at my drawers, look at my cabinets. It freaks me out. So like, I feel like my website's the same. I don't want people on there like, oh, this idea's here. So I design my website over and over every time I release. So it's just in construction, but there's not any product, I should say. There's zero product on there, so you guys don't worry about it. You're not missing gotcha. anything. Okay, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, cool. I know everyone has their own method or um, just way of getting out of creative rut, but do you have any tips? 
I, I great question. I, I mean, I'll go for a walk, go for a jog, but more, uh, what am I trying to say, I'm to the extreme, I went to Cave Creek, Arizona a few weeks back by myself and spent a week in the desert. It was, um, it was, I didn't know I needed that. And, and it, it got to the point where I was, it wasn't burnout, but it was just too much distraction and I was not, I was not understanding this again. So I went out there by myself. It was pretty scary because it was, you know, coyotes and there's no lights, but it, it, it just, it was a good moment to reset. But I think from a simple basic perspective is step away from the computer, step away from all that stuff, listen to some music and just walk around. Uh, uh, I go to Target a lot and I, I look at a lot of just random stuff and just be like, it just recharges something like, damn, what if I, what if I made some type on this bowl? You know, like, I don't know why Target, but I, Wine bottles, I'd like to decorate my own wine bottle, like things like that, it helps recharge. Yeah. Yes. Um, what are some things that you tend to like remind yourself whenever you like veer off of your path, your direction? Like what's your way of kind of like re getting back onto like what you're doing it for? Um, you know, maybe some like reminders or anything you kind of tend to keep in mind? Great question. I constantly think about my parents. My dad passed in 2009 and my mom almost passed a couple years after gracefully she's still alive but she has she hard of hearing she's, she's her but i think about the sacrifices that they went through my mom grew up in arkansas literally went to the school um where they had the uh first busing protests in little rock arkansas thinking about the sacrifices that she had to go through obviously i wasn't born yet just so i could go to school go to college you know these things like i'm like damn you i can st i have a, like i said i have an eight-year-old but I can stay up a little longer for Dallas, or I can stay up a little longer for Tra I could, I could sacrifice and not put myself back in the hospital, but just take a little extra step because I do care way too, and I don't say too much about people, I care more about others than myself a lot. And I think that constantly reminding myself that, hey, I gotta take care of myself, but damn, your parents had to go through a lot just so you can do this that you're doing. So that, yeah. I think in conjunction with her question, it's how do you how do you redirect yourself when you find out you're straying off the path? In other words, you said keep your direction, but human nature makes us stray off that frequently. How do you you know what mechanisms do you have in place to say okay, I'm. I'm like going somewhere that is not in line and in sync with my set direction and how do you get yourself back on that path? From a literal tangible, tangible perspective, I go, I spend hours at half price books. I'm the guy every Friday, I'll spend a hundred dollars. I don't know how you do that at half price books. I'm buying all the, <laughs> check this, I'm buying these goofy, like look at this. Trees, tree houses, huts and forts, cartoon, like I'm buying these old references because it, it helps me get back to, damn, like don't worry about all this stuff out here. This is what you love, this is where you came from. So that, but then also I'll call Trey <laughs> at 11.99 at night, you know, and be like, hey, what do you think about this? Or, or snap me back to reality, you know? You gotta have a Trey Green on your team, you know? It's, you can't do it all, all, all on your own. I'm very appreciative of this man right here because he's, Played D1 football at Northwestern. Worked at uh, Richard's group. We, he probably don't want me to say that very loud. And then uh, Wyden Kennedy. Like he's one of the most uh, just smartest people I've ever met in my life. So get yourself a Trey Green who can help. Because we can't do it on our own, you know. But me, I go to half price books and spend too much money. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.